Sponsors of the Party Patriots who believe in personal freedom, economic freedom, and our debt-free future, and the future of our children. The speaker tonight, um, you know, I, I was kind of doing a quick bio for him. Uh, I don't know how he has time to be here this evening. The man's very, very busy, very, very involved. He's actually looking out for himself and everybody else in the state of Minnesota. Um, Ted is a, is a business leader, a former member of the Minnesota State Senate from 2010 to 2012 in uh, District 56. Uh, the other thing, he also is a co-publisher of the Lily Suburban Newspapers. A conservative read, gotta like that. Um, in the Minnesota State Senate, he was elected to serve as the first freshman majority whip. He also served as assistant leader to the vice chair of the Legislative Commission on Gov Local Governments and the Jobs and the Jobs Economic Growth Committee. Uh, Ted is a graduate of Gustavus Adolphus. Uh, I would love to list all these board, board positions that you are on, but we'd be here for another 15 minutes. About Ted's topic, um, it's kind of near and dear to our hearts because the topic taxed enough already. With that, Ted Lilly. Thank you, Dave. You know, tonight reminds me of a night many, many years ago. Ronald Reagan was in Minnesota. He was here campaigning for a legislator, and uh, he was on the upper north northwest Minnesota, and he was at a farm, and he went up to the farm, knocked on the door, and he said, I'm here to talk to you about conservative principles, about liberty principles. And the farmer said, well, we're Democrats. We're all Democrats up here. We've never had a Republican come here. Reagan said, I know, I know, but I'm still here to talk to you. So the farmer went in, grabbed his wife, and said, come on, you got to listen to this guy. He's a, he's a conservative. We've never had one of them up here. He went out and got all his workers out of the farm, talked to some neighbors, and they all came and they gathered around in the driveway area. And Reagan was going to tell them about conservative principles. And he couldn't find a place to speak because they were all there, but he found this big pile of manure. Yeah. And as we all know, Ronald Reagan never was afraid to step in it when he had to. So he climbed right up on that, on that pile of manure, and he went and he talked to those people about liberty, he talked about freedom, he talked about government spending, he talked about taxes, he talked about all the issues that were important. And when, when he was done, they actually cheered. They actually clapped for him. And the wife said, wow, that's the first time I've ever heard a Republican make sense. Ronald Reagan said, yeah, and that's the first time I've ever given a speech from the Democratic platform. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> Are we taxed enough? Yes. Are we taxed enough? Are we fed up? Are we frustrated? Because we should be. We are taxed way higher than we need to be. Um, I want to, I do, Greg, want to share just a little bit, one, one other thing about myself. Uh, yeah, I am a past state senator, and I'm from uh, my, the area that I served was from Woodbury to Stillwater in that area. Uh, but I have a lot of allegiance to Rochester. This is my second home. Uh, my wife actually grew up here. I was married in Rochester. Uh, my wife now is a family physician for Mayo, uh, so has worked here. Uh, my father-in-law is a retired uh, physician with Mayo and uh, have a brother-in-law that, that works here and another brother-in-law that works at IBM. So this is my second home, and actually I'm gonna be moving here sometime soon when I can, I'm working on selling my business or working with my business, but at some point I'm gonna be joining you here in Rochester, and I'm really looking forward to that because this is a great community. It has so much to offer, and our quality of life here is so good. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that point. Um, but I do, want to, I do really want to talk to you about your taxes tonight because it, it's outrageous. It's outrageous what our legislators are doing in Minnesota and on the federal level, and we cannot afford the government that they are spending what they are doing to us, and we need to find a way to change that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, yes. Is that right? <laughs> so what does the Taxpayers League of Minnesota do? We are the champion of you, the residents of Minnesota, the taxpayers. Uh, we advocate for lower taxes, limited government, free enterprise, 
and local control. Okay, those are the core principles of the Taxpayers League. And we are the champion of the taxpayers in Minnesota. We continue to fight for you. And the areas that we work on uh, is we have the, the taxpayer rally uh, at the Capitol every year. We've had that for 17 years. Uh, we do the legislative scorecard, and I handed out a number of scorecards to everybody. Uh, if anyone did not get one, there are a few more on the table over here. Please do go ahead and get one. Uh, we also are the holders of the Taxpayer Protection Pledge, and the pledge is an agreement between, the tax, be, between you, the taxpayer, and your elected officials. And when they sign that pledge, they're committing to you that they will not raise taxes during, during the legislative session that they are working on. But it's really something that we hold for you, but it's, it's your pledge from your legislative leaders. Um, and by the way, uh, Steve Draskowski is one of the local legislators who has signed that, Representative Draskowski, and there are others. And if you look at the front of the scorecard, they're the ones that have a star on the front, and they also had 100%. So there are a number of folks on the front of the scorecard that have a star, and they also had 100% on the scores, on, on our scorecard. We also have a great website, and we encourage you to access our website. It's taxpayerslead.org. Uh, please learn about the organization there. Uh, we also do a pledge, uh, excuse me, a, a podcast every week during the legislative session, and that again is available at the, at the website. You can sign up and subscribe to that. And what we do on the podcast is we talk about what is happening at the Capitol, what bills should you be watching for, what should you be aware of, and, and what, where should we, we be looking at. Uh, and we also uh, take care of True North, which is a, uh, a website that has columns and stories and blogs uh, from others who are conservative and, and that, that are writing things that are important to you. So these are the things that the Taxpayers League of Minnesota does for you, and we're very proud of that work that we do. Um, I have a question for you. Are we on the right track in Minnesota with our no, taxes, no. with our liberties, with our freedoms? We're absolutely not. Minnesota is going the wrong direction, and it's frightening. It's fear I'm very fearful of the future of our state. Uh, our Minnesota state government officials keep telling us that everything is just fine, everything is going well, that we, we have this Minnesota miracle, and that, that things are being great in Minnesota, we're, we're growing jobs, we're leading the country in so many ways. But the truth of the matter is that that's our history, that's our past. Are we still doing that? We are concerned that that is not the case, that we're no longer leading the country. We have big problems that are out there, and they're getting more and more obvious all the time to each of us. Uh, it used to be that Minnesota led the nation in unemployment, in jobs, job participation. Our job participation is at the lowest level it's been since 1980. Okay, so we used to be one of the best for job participation for workers that participate in the workforce, and we're back down to the level we were in 1980. We used to lead the country in, in our unemployment numbers, having the best unemployment numbers in the country, but, but we're, the gap is closing. The rest of the country is catching up to Minnesota, and, and we're losing that leadership that we've had. Uh, if we look back at the 2014 year, uh, they said that Minnesota grew, I think it was 22,000 jobs in Minnesota. Uh, so again, we were growing. But oh, by the way, last week, I don't know if you saw this, the state demographer came out and said, no, we were off by a third. We over, had a number that was a third too high. A third of those jobs were not real. So these things are happening in Minnesota, they're real. Uh, another thing that's happening in Minnesota is when Governor Dayton came into office, there were 21 Fortune 500 companies in Minnesota. Today there are 17. In five years, we've gone from 21 Fortune 500 companies to 17. There, there's target after target after target that tell us that Minnesota is on the wrong path, on the wrong track, and we need to change. Minnesota is starting to become substantially different from our surrounding states on basic issues, uh, on where people are choosing to live, where they locate, where they, where they invest their futures, where companies are investing. We've heard about Medtronic leaving, we hear about companies that are leaving the state of Minnesota, and our competitiveness is, is diminishing on a daily basis because of what has been happening at the legislature, and if we don't change it, we're going to be in trouble, period. So. Let's talk about a few of these factors that are affecting the, the residents of Minnesota. Uh, one, of the, one of the groups that we like to look at is the Tax Foundation, and the Tax Foundation has a, a yearly business tax climate index, 
and they list the best states. Uh, the ones that are in, in gray are the best states, and they list the 10 worst tax climate states, which Minnesota is one of the 10 worst tax states in the country. And as you look at that list, it's a shame. <laughs> it's a shame because businesses are making decisions about where to locate, and if their tax climate isn't there, that's not the only reason that they choose where to locate. But this is a significant issue, and that is being demonstrated by what, they, what these groups are doing. The 10 best states <clears throat> include states like South Dakota, our, our neighbors. They include Florida, Texas, used to include Washington. Uh, Washington dropped to 11th this last year because of some of their changes. But these aren't just, you know, sometimes they say it's just Arkansas and other states like that that have low taxes. These are, these are good states. These are good quality states with good programs, good workforce, good education. And yet Minnesota is not on that list. Minnesota is on this list, the worst states. And Minnesota is number 47. This is 2014. This is 2015. And Minnesota, again, is the fourth from the bottom. Is that a list that we want to be on? No, we don't, we don't think so. And, and again, do we want to be up in the, in the top 10? Yes, that would be nice. But let's just get out of the bottom 10. Yeah. That, that would be our goal. Let's just get out of the bottom 10. So what's the difference? The states that are in the top 10, most of them have an absence of, absence of one of the major taxes, income tax, personal income tax, corporate tax, sales tax, uh, property tax. Some of the states don't use all of those taxing tools that are available to the government. The bottom 10 states, on the other hand, they use all of those, and Minnesota is one of those that use all of those taxes. We also are very complicated with our taxes, and they're at comparatively high rates compared to many of our neighboring competing states. And the other thing that, our, that the bottom 10 do is they use taxes to socially engineer outcomes and pick winners and losers in life and in business. And that's not a role of government, that's not something that we should be doing. So let's talk about a tale of two states, two different states that are on different paths. North Carolina is a state that is making decisions. Uh, they, were, they were ranked number 44, uh, 44th from the bottom, uh, or, you know, the 44th worst state uh, in 2014, but because of the changes they've made, they've moved up to 16th in a matter of a couple years by changing their tax environment. Now, how did they do this? Uh, this index is a great benchmark for, for measuring the reforms passed in North Carolina. They're phasing in tax reform that passed in 2013. They took the individual tax rate from a multi-rate system with a top rate of seven and, seven, seven and three quarters percent uh, and restructure that down to 5.8% this year, and they're also looking to take it down to 5.75% in 2015. So the individual income taxes are lower, they're less complicated, and they did the same thing with the corporate tax rate. Corporate taxes went to, from 6.9% to 6%, and they're also going down to 5%, and if they reach certain targets, certain triggers, they'll go down to 3% in 2017. So that's a state that's saying, we want to compete, we want to compete to grow jobs, we want to have your families invest here, we want to find a way to grow, basically by lowering the taxes, we believe that we're going to raise the boat, raise all of, all of us, and find a way we'll get more income because our overall state economy will grow because of that. Now let's look at Minnesota. Minnesota, by contrast, enacted a tax package in 2012-2013 that reduces our competitiveness. And we all know this. They, they included a retroactive tax hike in the individual income taxes. They also, remember, they passed a number of business taxes that were so onerous that even the governor agreed that he couldn't have those and they were, they were taken away, they were backed off in that next session. So Minnesota is on the opposite path of North Carolina. And since 2012, Minnesota has dropped from 44th to 47th place. So we are going absolutely wrong direction. And we can think of another neighbor that's very close to us that's doing similar things to North Carolina. If you look at Wisconsin and some of the, some of the changes that they are making, they're basically saying, we believe that our future will be better if we leave more money in your hands, in the taxpayers' hands, give you the ability to succeed, then that allows you to, you to grow, not just the government to grow. Well, why do taxes matter so much? Why do we care? 
taxes matter because of competition. We, we all compete. With everything that we do in life, we compete. And if you can find another state that allows, that has lower tax rates, some of us are moving. Some of us might make that decision to move. Our businesses might choose to move. And I'm guessing that most of you know somebody who has chosen to leave the state of Minnesota over taxes. Uh, families are more mobile than ever. If you look at young people, uh, they're moving. They're making decisions to, to locate where they feel that their families can succeed. Uh, labor is more mobile. Investment capital is more mobile. And I'll tell you a story about investment capital. So investment capital, if you're starting a business, you need to go to a bank, and sometimes you know you go to a hard money lender or, or a, um, an angel fund or something like that to earn some, to get some money, capital to run your business. And uh, they, in, they don't invest in Minnesota, these angel funds, the way they do in other states. Other states are very active with these types of funds. Minnesota doesn't have that same level. But when I was in the Senate, uh, I was negotiating with Governor Dayton. I was there at the table with him, and I said, Governor, where do you invest your money? And Governor Dayton said, well, I suppose where I can get the best return. I said, exactly. And if we're not careful, the people of Minnesota will do that same thing, and they will invest their future someplace else. He said, I have more faith in the people of Minnesota than that. <laughs> yes, where does he have his money? South Dakota. South Dakota. It's not in Minnesota. <laughs> so Governor Dayton understands this. Whether he implements it or not, he understands what this means. Businesses locate where they have the greatest competitive edge, and families will do the same thing. That's, that's why this is so important. Location, location, location. Minnesota has had a history of having great skilled labor, but our neighbors are improving. Other states are improving. They're getting better. South Dakota, look at all the skilled labor that has left Minnesota and gone to South Dakota, to the oil fields. We're, we're finding that labor is, is moving to where they have that opportunity. They move to where the raw materials are. Lifestyle, let's talk about lifestyle. How many of us love this Minnesota winter that we have? <laughs> Actually, I, li I like it too, but I, it's not enough to keep me here. <laughs> this, this one was better than last year, wasn't that's it? That's why you're moving further south, I see. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Then you can't get away from um, um, all these faults. Um, ideas about, about what people think. If you ask me, global warming, global warming is 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 the Democrats going to extreme hot tempers. Hot tempers. <laughs> <laughs> well, many of us in Minnesota are in favor of a little global warming. That wouldn't be a bad thing necessarily. <laughs> uh, but taxes are are definitely a key decision in where we locate, where we locate a business or where a family stays. Families and businesses alike locate where, the, where they receive the best services that they can get for the lowest cost. And that, that's what we're going to do as we go forward. So let's talk about a couple of the groups that are specifically impacted by these taxes and that are mobile and that are making decisions. Small businesses are one of, the, one of these areas that are, that are looking at where to invest their future. 65% of new jobs are created by small businesses, according to the SBA, the Small Business Administration. And of those, 32% are by businesses with fewer than 50 people. So if you're growing an economy, growing a region, growing this Rochester area, yes, we need IBM to succeed. Yes, we need Mayo to succeed. But we also need all the small businesses to succeed and to have that opportunity to grow. And we need them to do it here. We want them to do it here. There's a group called the National Small Business Association, and they're America's small business advocates, and they did a 2013 small business taxation survey. You'll see, it, you'll see a trend here that's familiar. The tax code itself imposes a cost. It's not just the dollars, it's also the complexity. It's the complexity of filling out the taxes for these businesses. Um, and this is a significant disadvantage, disadvantage to America's small, business, small businesses. It actually punishes work, punishes investment, punish, punishes opportunity as we go forward. Did you know that the average small business spends over $5,000 a year just to fill out their form with their accountants? $5,000 a year just to fill out their forms. They spend over two weeks of their year. And this, you, can be a, you can be a small business with just a few employees. Two weeks doing your payroll taxes out of the year is spent on payroll taxes. These things, the, the complexity of the code 
is just as onerous as the dollars that are spent. Another group is seniors. Let's talk a little bit about our seniors in Minnesota and are we respecting them and asking them to continue to invest in Minnesota. Kiplinger Magazine does an annual survey of Minnesotans, of, of, of seniors in the country, and it advises people where they might want to retire. And guess what they call Minnesota? Minnesota is retirement hell. That's a national magazine saying that about us. This again is a rating, uh, and the green is the most tax-friendly states, and the red are the least, least tax-friendly, and there's Minnesota again, the least, one of the least friendly. And we're in good company with California and New York, you know, some of those same states that we've talked about before. Well, why is that? Did we know that Minnesota is one of only seven states that taxes Social Security benefits? In, 20, in 20, 2008, 14 states tax Social Security benefits. So across the country, there's a trend away from taxing Social Security benefits. But in Minnesota, we're still doing that. And the, the states are, in, are shaded here, the ones that are, that are taxing. We've got North Dakota, Nebraska, New Mexico, West Virginia, and then up here in the East Coast. But, but in this case, it's not even California or New York, some of the states that are supposedly progressive. Minnesota is an outlier. It's ridiculous. We should not be taxing Social Security benefits. Our seniors have paid in all their lives. They've, they've paid their taxes on, the, on their, their wages throughout their lives. There are 670,000 Minnesotans that are impacted by Social Security taxes. This could save an average of $600 per person that pays Social Security taxes. This is a big deal. And this is something that the Taxpayers League of Minnesota has been advocating for you uh, at the Capitol. There are a number of bills that are, that are looking at this, and uh, we will continue to push for that. And by the way, we think that this is one of those investments that we think the government, when they talk about having that surplus, we believe that this is an area that we should spend it in reducing the tax on Social Security in Minnesota. If we look again at the least friendly states, uh, Minnesota is number four from the bottom. Rhode Island, Vermont, Connecticut, and Minnesota. Well, why are we the retirement hell? Because we do tax income tax, and our top rate is almost 10%. We tax sales tax at 6.875%. We have a complex property tax system, and we also tax estate taxes, we tax Social Security benefits, we tax uh, pensions. Again, talk about an area that we should not tax, it's military pensions. Why do we tax military pensions? A lot of military retirees, they're, they're pretty young people, and they're making a decision where to spend their next 30, 40 years to, to start their careers, their second career. And we're telling them, don't come to Minnesota because we're one of the very few states that are taxing your benefits. So what did, what did Kiplinger say? They said, maybe the long winters in Minnesota aren't the only reason that seniors leave this state for warmer climates. And then this goes into more detail about, uh, about some of those taxes. So yes, we have a complex sales tax in Minnesota. I'll, I'll tell you a story about how complex our sales tax is for small businesses. I, I know a woman who had a cleaning service, and she had to keep track of dusting time. She was audited, and they came to her and they said, you know what, you need to keep track of dusting time. If you dust something that's attached to a wall, that's taxable. But if you touch something, dust something that's not attached to a wall, that's not. So can you imagine a one-person operation having to keep track of what time they spend dusting what? and then charge a sales tax based on that? It's impossible. You cannot do it. And what they're doing is they're making criminals of average citizens. That, that's what they're doing here. Uh, property taxes, again, are very complex. We, get, we pay in, we get refunds, we have the homestead credits. Most people really don't understand how that property tax works, and seniors, seniors are in that same boat. The state taxes, Minnesota is one of the few states that tax the state taxes. Very few states do tax it. But of those that tax estates, Minnesota is one of the very small group that does not conform with the federal level. So at the federal level, there's an exemption up to a $5 million estate. So think about a farmer that lives, out, lives in our area here, that has a good sized farm, has been working in his whole career, wants to hand it off to his next generation, 
and uh, and the uh, and it's worth five million dollars because the price of land has gone up. Well, they don't have to pay a state tax on the federal level, but they do on the state level because we charge starting at one million. So why would we not conform to the federal level as other states who tax uh, estate taxes should do that? Um, we also have a gift tax, and it's it's just very complex and very frustrating. So. Do these taxes really have an impact on people? Are they making decisions about to, whether to leave the state or not? This is, this is a report, a chart, that came from the Minnesota On the Move, Minnesota Demography Center from 2015. And if we look at it, there are ages at the bottom and thousands of people that are leaving the state of Minnesota or coming in on the, on the left. 5,000, 10,000, 15, 20, 25, okay? So this is zero to four. Uh, 20 to 24, uh, here's 45, 50, 60, and 80. The green is in migration, so that's the people that are moving into the state of Minnesota. The red is the out migration. So what's important is if you look at this chart and you see right here, you see that there are about 12, 13,000 people that are age 15 to 19 that are moving into Minnesota but there are almost 20,000 people that are moving out of Minnesota, that are leaving Minnesota. So this age group, and if you think about it, these, these are the people that are going to college, they're, they're choosing what to do early in their career, and they're not coming back to Minnesota. They're leaving the state and they're not coming back. The other group that is being significantly impacted by migration is seniors. And this chart, this is 55, 65, 75, 85. So again, the red is people that are leaving the state of Minnesota, the green are people that are moving in. So if they tell you that seniors are not leaving the state of Minnesota, they are. They are. And, and this is from the state demographer again. And here, look at the 60 to 64. Here, they, here we have uh, 1,500, and this is 3,000 that are, that are leaving the state. So what is that? Let's, let's think about that a little bit. So a lot of folks have worked their whole careers. They buy that second home in Arizona, in Florida, in New Mexico, someplace warm. Uh, they're going south for the, for the winter. Uh, snowboard, snowboards, right? But because of the tax situation, people are making decisions that I'm not just going for the winter, I'm gonna go for half the year plus a day so that I can change my residence and not have to pay the tax in Minnesota. That, that's what we're forcing people to make decisions to do. So they're leaving Minnesota, and, and the demographics prove this out. The other interesting thing, if I go back to the other chart um, that this, this study shows, is there are about 113,000 people that move into Minnesota every year. There are about 100,000 people that move out of Minnesota. Okay? But the ones that are moving out of Minnesota are the ones that are U.S. citizens. The ones that are moving into Minnesota are people who have been born someplace else in the world. Okay, so is it the benefits? What, 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 are, what are people that are moving into Minnesota from someplace else, what, what is their reason? I, I don't know that, I don't know those numbers, but the numbers don't lie. It's interesting because if, you're, if you've been born in the United States and you're a Minnesota resident, you're more likely to leave then come the other way. That, that's what these numbers say. So let's talk about the 2013-2014 session. Did it make things better? No. no. So that's, those are the two years that we had Governor Dayton and we had the DFL-controlled House, the DFL-controlled Senate. And if you recall, we had a $600 million projected deficit. So what did, what did Governor Dayton do? He said, oh, we have this, this hole, $600 million. Let's fill it. Let's raise taxes $2.1 billion. $600 million, $2.1 billion tax increase on the citizens of Minnesota. Um, while other states are passing right to work, Minnesota gave unions more power, more money, and the ability to compel people to join them. And we all know about what happened with the daycares and different things. Uh, the, day, the unions got big increases. Governor Dayton followed through on his campaign promises. 
and gave them a lot for, for their support of him. Uh, more money to government and government officials. We all heard about the commissioners. Governor Dayton raised the salaries of the commissioners in Minnesota. Uh, and less money for you, the citizens of Minnesota. Taxes so onerous that they repealed some of them in 2014. And again, we know that they raised taxes $2.1 billion and they gave back $400 million in, in cuts. To me, that's like someone stealing your car and then they took, they came back and they said, yeah, but it's okay because we'll give you your wheels back. But they really didn't give them back to you, they gave them to your next door neighbor. <laughs> they didn't give them to you. Will 2015 bring tax relief? Will it bring relief to us? Well, we have a supposed $1.87 billion surplus. That's 5% of the budget. They overtaxed you 5%. They overcollected, took out of your pocket, reached in, took out of your pocket 5% more than they needed, even at that higher level that they were at. Um, the budget uh, that Governor Dayton is proposing is $42 million. During the last biennium, it was $39 million. Okay, so he wants to grow it for, to 42. And actually, now that this uh, surplus, supposed surplus has come out, he wants to spend even more of that. And oh, by the way, he wants a gas tax on top of that. He wants to add a, a gas tax to the wholesale level of gas because he thinks that you won't understand that that's a tax on you. That's a tax on somebody else. Um, do we need a gas tax? We don't think so. We really don't think so. And then we've got Mincher. Uh, there are three basic plans with Mincher. Uh, one of them is to make it a state agency. The Democrats want to make it a state agency so it's a permanent fixture of our state government. Uh, there are some Republicans that instead want to eliminate it, and I suppose the third option is to do nothing and let it kind of flounder and hang, hang there. Uh, and if that happens, it probably will implode, implode under its own pressure because there aren't enough people that are signing up for it. They're way under meeting their, their projections. They've had to cut their budget. And oh, by the way, did you hear what they're cutting? Customer service. <laughs> they were doing such a great job with customer service before that they've decided to cut the budget for customer service even more. The 2013 Ford. Oh, I went the wrong way. Okay, so I, I've got a couple charts here that are in the scorecard. Uh, so many of you have the scorecard there, and I and I just wanted to point out a couple things about them. So this chart, uh, there are two lines here. One is the general fund and the other is the all funds. And when you hear politicians talk, when you read a story, when you watch TV, when you hear about the budget, when the governor is talking about the budget, he's talking about the general fund. The general fund is basically the fund that they feel that they control most directly, okay? But the truth is, what politicians are not telling you, that that is only part of what they are spending. The truth is that there's an all funds that includes all the government spending uh, in Minnesota, uh, all the state level spending, and that is a higher number. Now, this, this chart is per person in 2013 dollars, so it's levelized, annualized to 2013. And if you look at the difference between the general fund and the all fund, you see that it's growing from a very small difference to a very big difference. You see that it's had some tremendous growth and look what has happened. This is when the Republicans were in the legislature. And this is what happens when the Democrats control the House, the Senate, and the governorship. That's how they spend. So during this period of time, your budget, your family budget, went up about 4% on average in Minnesota. State spending went up 12%. So they went up 12%. And this number right here was that $39 billion number. Now they want to take it up to 42 billion. They want to take it up like this. Spending has gone up 20% since Governor Dayton has been in office. 20% in Minnesota. Yes, sir. Excuse me. What is that grouping of all funds? What is it? You said it was more than the general fund, but what exactly represents? What's in that difference? Sir, it includes uh, some some of the transportation budget. Uh, some of the uh, health and welfare that does not hit the general fund, some of the uh, transfers between state and national government, federal government, 
So we give money, we, they take money into the state government, they take money into the national government, the monies go back and forth, but this is the real spending that is happening per capita in Minnesota during that period of time. And please, feel free to ask questions as, as we go through these things. So again, you can see that per capita in 1960, we were spending about $2,000. We're now up, up over $12,000, and if Governor Dayton has his way, we'll be up close to $15,000 per person in Minnesota in our spending. It's frightening. It's frightening. This is a look at how that money is spent. Okay? So if you look at a percent of the budget, a percent of the budget, the bulk of the money that the state of Minnesota spends is on health and human services. Out of, out of 100%, I don't know if that's two-thirds or, you know, but it's a significant number. Another big part is education, and then transportation, and then it comes down to other important things like the judicial system, economic development, cor uh, corrections, debt service is a big block, higher ed, environment, Etc. Etc. Oh, look at this one. I triple R B. Basically, a slush fund for for the Democrats in the Iron Range. The, the um, it's the it's the Iron Range fund that comes from Taconite and from different things, and they're able to spend it on things like golf courses and ski resorts and things like that. So when when they talk to us about raising the gas tax, because we need to invest in transportation. Wouldn't we think that there might be some room to find priorities and to find efficiencies in some of the rest of our budget? That, that's why this is important to you, is to look at, the, look at how the government is spending its money and to find ways to do it better. So what can we do? Uh, tomorrow is the first deadline in the legislature. The, the first deadline. So what that means is that if there is a bill that is important to you, if there's something that you feel is important, such as the Social Security tax exemption, pensions, or the state tax, or, or something else, uh, that bill has to have been heard in either the House or the Senate by tomorrow. Uh, so make sure that you're talking with your legislators about bills that are important to you. Uh, so that, and then there are other deadlines that come up throughout the process. Uh, second thing, second bullet point, don't give up, don't leave, don't, you know, be one of the people that stays here and fights for what's right, because it's important that we do that, we, it really is. And show up, make your voices heard, and that's part of what being in the Tea Party is, that's what being here is about, is making sure that you are aware of what is happening, what your government is doing, what your leaders are doing, and find ways to engage in the process, talk to your legislators, talk to your governor. It makes a difference. I can tell you that from my perspective as a past legislator. Uh, so make sure that you're talking with them and let them know what you're thinking. And again, these are, these are the, some of the things that the Taxpayers League does. Questions? Yes? Yeah, um, how come Obama said that if you're making um, even put up the figure on the uh, on the on, on the wall, and, and I'm not making that much. In fact, I'm 65, you know, and I'm retired, and um, I still gotta pay a horrendous amount of taxes because I'm retired, and, and I already paid tax on that money, and um, that's not like like that financial expert on. Fox News said, that's, that's nuts, you know? <laughs> and I think, you know, why, why is he, why is Obama doing this when, when I'm not making 2000 I'm ma making way under that. We, we, the question was, why is Obama, why are the legislators, why are they telling us that we're not paying our fair share, is basically what they're yeah. saying. We're not paying the right amount. And I, and I think that really what's happening is the Democrats basically have a war on your wealth, an attack on your achievement. They're coming after you, they're trying to take your, your opportunity away from you. What has made Minnesota, what has made America great is that opportunity. That opportunity that we have inside us that tells us that we want to succeed, that we're going to work hard, we're going to invest, we're going to take risks, 
We're going to find ways to succeed in life. We want our opportunity for our families to do the same thing. And yet, we're being told that because of that, we should be punished. It's not right. It's not right. That's not the America we grew up in. It's not the way it should be. And that's why we have to stand up together to say enough. No, we are paying our fair share. And we have to find a way to stop it. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, on this tax and social security, is, is there a strong effort to do away with that? There is. There is. There actually are four, I think it's four bills uh, that are being heard in the legislature this year. Uh, the tax committee is, is hearing that. Uh, the chair of the tax committee is, is David's in the House, uh, who's from Preston, just south of here. <clears throat> Many of the legislators who are working on it are from uh, the border communities around our neighboring states because they're the ones that are hearing about it most because people are moving to Wisconsin, they're moving to other areas. Uh, but I think, there's, I think there's a likelihood that it will reach further in the process. Now we have to trust, and this is one of those points where we, where you can make a difference by reaching out to Chair Davids, Representative Davids, uh, reaching out to your legislators and letting them know that this is important to you, that you know, and, and tell them the impact on your family that this is this is important and this and this is why. Um, so yes, I think there is an opportunity for them to pass to be part of the final budget. Again, if we look at the um, Look at the 2.1 or the 1.89 billion dollar supposed surplus. Wouldn't it be reasonable to spend part of that on giving back to our seniors who have given so much to our state? That, that would be reasonable. So that is something that we believe that the taxpayers believe that we should advocate for, continue to advocate for, and find a way to make that happen. Yeah, I never realized the vast majority of states don't tax. Again, only seven states do. And what, what the bills do is they're, they're very reasonable. Uh, they, they look out over a period of, I think it's between five and 10 years, and they take a piece of it every year for 10 years, 10% uh, a year or 20% a year. Uh, so it's not all in one year that, that they do that. Uh, but Iowa just finished this. Iowa basically made the decision to not charge, uh, not force people to pay tax on Social Security. And they said, let's do this over five years, so every year, they changed the amount a little bit, and the state was able to adapt with that and grow with that. And at this point now, seniors are not paying Social Security tax in Iowa. So that's a process that could happen. Yes, sir? Yeah, um, say if we elect a Republican president, and say, like, say, I don't know. When, so, when we elect? Okay, when, when, yes. Okay, when we elect a Republican president, say, say like, I know some Republicans want a flat tax, some want a fair tax. Say if he wants a flat tax, will all the fair tax supporters vote for the flat tax? Say vice versa, say if it's a fair tax, all the flat tax supporters vote for it. Okay, so the question is fair tax, flat tax, and, and basically the, see, Republicans, so the, conservatives, see. will they work together on policies when they have kind of different viewpoints? So like, so they say the uh, president has wants a flat tax, will the fair tax supporters vote for the flat tax, or vice versa? Mm -hmm. And, and I think that the answer is, that's up to you. That's up to all of us. We need to have those conversations together. One of the challenges that Republicans have, that Democrats, liberals don't have, is that we are so principled in what we believe that we kind of silo ourselves. We, you know, we're flat tax. We're fair tax. We're for right to work. We're for, you know, whatever it is, Liberty Caucus or, you know, Democrats aren't that way. They think in the collective. Okay? They, think in the, they think basically in a pyramid. And as long as it works together to get their president elected, to get their governor elected, to get their legislator, they'll all give a little bit. I mean, can you imagine a hard hat union member agreeing with an uh, abortion rights advocate? They, they don't agree. They don't agree. But they're willing to work together they're willing to work together to get a Democrat elected because they feel they've come together. We as Republicans have problems with that. And this is a challenge that I have to you. We as Republicans, as conservatives, as Tea Party members, Liberty Caucus people, we have to find a way to work together. And I guess my belief is that you want to elect the most conservative person that you can elect, but get them elected. Because when you get them elected, 
then they are the, then they are there. They're representing you. You need to have look at the difference this year by having a house that is in Republican hands. That you don't have a Democrat House, Senate, and Governor. We're not talking about a 2.1 billion dollar tax increase again because we have a Republican House. So, so we. I'll come back to your question specifically, but, but this is really an important point for all of us. We need to be able to work together. And if you can elect that most conservative person that you can and get them elected, then you can turn around and help them be more conservative as, as they are there. And it's up to us as citizens to find ways to have a louder voice and say, I've had enough. We're taxed enough already. We will not take this anymore. We'll, we'll talk to the Taxpayers League, we'll sign up on, our, on the website, we'll show up at the Capitol, we'll do all the things that are necessary to let them know that I'm taxed enough and I will not take it anymore and we need to find a way to keep more money, more opportunity, more prosperity in your hands. Every time that dollar leaves your hands and goes into the governor's hands, in the state's hands, it's not available for your family. And they believe that they, have, they know better than you, they're smarter than you, they, they know better than you, um, and it simply is not the case. If I had a choice, I would leave the money in your hands. We can find efficiencies, we can find priorities, we can find ways to lower the taxes, to spend less money, we can do that. In 2010, one of the things that we tried to put forward was that we would, um, that, that we would have uh, flat hiring in the state. We would have zero-based budgeting. We tried to do the things that you do at home that, that businesses do. We tried to find ways to implement policies that make sense over the long term. And a number of those policies made it through, but of course they were taken back away again by the, when the Democrats control all sides. Um, Taxpayers of Lake in Minnesota needs your help. We have a sign up over here uh, for email addresses, for different information. Please join us in fighting for this together. We can make a difference and we will do that. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ted.